It is kind of funny to be coming from Ohio and being a wilderness medicine fellow. Um, Cause although we don't have a lot of mountains, we actually do have uh, a great lake near us and we have um, a lot of stuff around. I mean, there's a lot of uh, wilderness stuff going on in Michigan and stuff, but yeah, I am a wilderness medicine fellow at uh, the University of Utah. And when I tell people that, the typical question that they ask me is, well, what, what does that mean? You, you go up into the, into the mountains and you set up a clinic and you treat bears or something like that. I, like, I think people do get kind of confused between wilderness medicine and veterinary medicine. But, um, you know, a lot of times what we're all about and what we're wanting to do is exactly what you guys are doing. And so that's why it's so great to be able to, to work uh, with you guys. And thank you, Davis County Sheriff's Office, for having us out here. Um, we do uh, a lot of, we end up doing a lot of education because it's, you know, ha uh, by happenstance that a physician is going to be a part of your search and rescue team or in the, in the location that an injury happens. Uh, but a lot of times what we're looking at is more the science behind uh, what's going on and trying to uh, develop best practices in uh, various different areas that have to do with wilderness medicine and then imparting that information on to folks who actually you know, go out there for 10 hours in the middle of the night and uh, are you know, looking for someone and need to, need to have that information and go, okay, great, now I have this person. What, what can I do for them before they get to you and your nice warm emergency department? So um, thank you for the nice introduction. I thought the best thing that we could do for you guys is uh, in talking about trauma is just kind of throw up a few different uh, case scenarios. These are all made up cases, but uh, some of them are based off of, you know, uh, patients that I've actually seen and just try to give you a kind of a smattering of different things. I, I try to focus all on, on cases that would be very uh, typical for uh, Ohio or for not Ohio, but for Utah. Uh, in very likely things that you could encounter out there. So our first case to get started, I, I will read this off, not that I'd, I know that you in the, in the physical audience can, can read this just fine, but uh, just in case for our digital audience, in case they can't actually see uh, the, the screen that well. So uh, case one is uh, you're called to respond to a 28-year-old male who is hiking King's Peak in the Uintas, which is at 13,527 feet. That is the highest point in our great state of Utah. Uh, his friends note that he has been complaining of a headache and some nausea. He did take a fall yesterday, and when his friends woke up this morning, they noted that his mental status was altered, so they called search and rescue. When you guys get on the scene, you note that the patient is confused, drowsy, and ataxic. He has several episodes, of, he's had several episodes of nausea and vomiting, and you're noting Shane Stroke's respirations. I gave you guys a... a little demonstration of what chain strokes uh, respiration looks like here and in case you haven't experienced it especially for our EMS students in the in the room uh, what, what you tend to see is uh, the patients who are who are demonstrating this type of respiration they'll be apneic for a period of time and then suddenly they'll <gasps> and take several deep breaths that would be deeper than what would be normal for a human and then will go apneic for a period of time again and then that that pattern will repeat and so you can see that in the lower left hand corner what that looks like if you were to graph out the inspiration and expirations there his vital signs are as follows heart rate of 115 blood uh, beats per minute uh, 45 breaths per minute o2 sat of 60 percent on room air sounds like a pretty healthy guy right so um, I'm going to try to make this, I know no one ever wants to talk at these things, but I'm going to try to make this somewhat uh, interactive. So what do you guys think is going on with this guy? Hypoxic. He is hypoxic, yes. His, o, his O2 sat is 60%, but why is he hypoxic? Altitude. Okay. So what does that mean? He's, you mean we go to altitude and we get hypoxic? What? What's going on? What, what's, what about the altitude might be causing him to become hypoxic? Or what's going on with him? What can you? Lower partial pressure of oxygen. Yep. Get less oxygen transport. So when you guys, if you guys are to come upon someone who is altered mentally, uh, not obviously not breathing well, but uh, the, the People who've been with him say that he's ataxic, which means he's not walking right, that he's really coma, kind of comatose or stuporous. 
what, what kind of things are you guys thinking might be going on? And I, I did throw in a, a confounding variable here. He also hit his head yesterday. Yeah, it's possible closed head injury. So closed head injury, absolutely. Uh, and in terms of the altitude, you guys, so when we talk about altitude illnesses, what are we talking about? What, you have acute mountain sickness, right? High altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema. Very good. So, uh, what I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make this a little bit easier uh, for you and just say that he, that in this case we're not going to say that he hit his head uh, or that that he has a brain bleed, even though that is a possibility because he hit his head. But what kind of uh, equipment do you think would be useful to bring up? And keeping in mind from the lecture that we just saw that you're carrying this stuff up there. So you know, bringing an ICU is not going to be very uh, useful unless it's an air ICU, but right now we don't have that. So what kind of things might you want to bring up with you to help this guy out when you're going up? What was that? Yeah, I'll give you a mule. You can have a mule. No, no four by fours, no ATVs, but you can have a mule. This is a wilderness area after all. So oxygen, right? I, I think I heard someone say that. Any, is there uh, any medications you guys would want to bring with other than oxygen? Dexamethasone. Okay, epinephrine. What, what's the epinephrine going to do? I could help it with his breathing, just the open airway, maybe make it available if he needs to get the oxygen. Mm -hmm. Certainly if he has uh, an allergic, if this is actually an allergic reaction, you wouldn't really know that until you get there, right? So that's, that's a pretty good idea. Uh, is there any devices that you can that you might want to use uh, to if you can't get the guy off the mountain? A gamma bag. A gamma bag. Okay, great. So we're going to talk about all those things. So haste, uh, specifically, I was thinking an epidural hematoma, but right, any I mean, you can't really diagnose that without a CT scan or at least a neurosurgeon or someone uh, pretty well trained. So in, you know, for your standpoint, it would just be a uh, head injury. Um, so this person has haste, uh, high altitude cerebral edema, and uh, that is caused by uh, being at altitude. Specifically, uh, you get into trouble from, from increasing your altitude too quickly and, and not taking the proper precautions to protect yourself. Um, I believe... I, I don't think I put the statistics in here. Uh, it's, it's pretty uncommon in Colorado at the ski resorts, but as we get a little bit higher into the 13, 14,000 range, as we get up into mountains like Denali or into the Himalayas, it can become much more common. Um, for, in terms of treatment, uh, supplemental, a lot of times people who know that they're going to altitude, they'll, they'll start taking dexamethasone. Uh, before they even uh, start to ascend up to those high al altitude regions. Uh, and um, in terms of what we want to do for this guy, we want to get him on oxygen to get that O2 sat up. He was at 60%. We want to get him down. Ultimately, this is what's going to save this guy's life. Anything else we do is just buying time until we can do this. The gamma bag, and then... Uh, so dexamethasone, so the treatment in the field <clears throat> for someone who's sick is 8 milligrams once, and that's any route. This guy you'll probably have to do like an IM injection unless you have the capabilities of doing IV. It, he's, he's so out of it that, that PO is not going to work, uh, but you can use IM and that's just fine. So an 8 milligram once and then 4 milligrams uh, every 6 hours. And so If that's all you have, I certainly would try it. Um, you know, nasal absorption is always a little bit more sporadic. I, th I think it would, it would work. It's just the time frame can be very kind of hit or miss. And if you, uh, you know, depending on how much fluid that ends up being that you're pushing in there, um, it, I think it's four milligrams per milliliter. Am I correct on that? So I think it's two milliliters. So if you shot one in each, in each nostril, it'd probably be fine. But you know, if it ends up being too much fluid, sometimes it just all drains back out their nose anyway. But it's certainly a good idea. Um, so this is a gamma bag over here. And uh, basically, it's, 
It folds down to the size of a backpack. I think they're about 30 pounds. Um, so it's something that you can definitely carry into the field, although the person who's carrying it probably is not going to be carrying a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, they use these a lot up at Everest ER, uh, up at um, some of the other clinics in, in the Himalayas. Certainly have them on Denali. Um, and the rest of us just get to kind of look at them and play with them uh, without really using them too much. But uh, it's, a, it's basically a, a uh, plasticized vinyl recompression chamber, essentially. It has a foot pedal that you, that you push. And someone has to be constantly on this pedal. The thing doesn't keep itself rigid on its own. So you have to be constantly pushing that, that pedal. It's got a couple windows uh, that you can look at the person. Uh, it's got that big uh, beefy zipper in the middle there. And uh, when you are using that, you can basically effectively decrease the person's altitude when they're inside that gamma bag by uh, 1,000 to 3,000 meters. So uh, again, it's not a replacement for getting the person out of the situation, but if you get to a patient and they're in the middle of a, of a bad storm and there's no way that you're going to move the patient in the middle of the night, this is a really good option to have. There are ports in there that you can plug it into oxygen and keep them going with oxygen and all that stuff as well. So yeah, we talked about medications. Uh, the two big medications when it comes to, to uh, HACE uh, and AMS are um, acetazolamide and dexamethasone. And when we think about altitude sickness, uh, acute mountain sickness, which is the AMS, and HACE, which is that high altitude cerebral edema, uh, that's considered a spectrum of disease. So a lot of times when we have people who you know, are coming from uh, the, the coasts and they come up to Park City and they're going skiing, you know, they may experience some, uh, some acute mountain sickness in the first few days and usually that's a headache plus something else. And so uh, headache plus nausea, vomiting, fatigue, dizziness, difficulty sleeping. You can see, you know, if you've ever talked to someone who just got here from New York or LA, uh, it's pretty easy to say, oh yeah, I got there the first night and I had a headache that next morning and I didn't really didn't sleep that well. Uh, you know, that's like, yeah, that, that's pretty common. I know when I lived in, in uh, Ohio and it would come up to altitude, you know, I would, I would definitely take me a few days to kind of get my sleeping down and, and to feel like a normal human being again. Uh, so the AMS or acute mountain sickness is sort of on the benign side of, of the spectrum. And then you have high altitude cerebral edema, which tends to be on the worst side of the spectrum. And that is um, generally AMS sy symptoms plus ataxia or mental status change. So by the time you're starting to really, if you're seeing that person who's been saying, yeah, I've been having this headache for the last few days and uh, suddenly, you know, you're trying to see them walk and they're stumbling into things and they can't walk. They're walking like, you know, like uh, John Wayne after a few too many drinks. Then, you know, now we're starting to worry about high altitude cerebral edema. And this is a true emergency. The, the person has to get out of that situation. Uh, so again, what people can do is they can take acetazolamide. Uh, 125 milligrams per day is the recommended dose. A lot of people are thinking you can actually take about half that dose. Um, that is a diuretic. You're going to pee your, you know, a whole bunch uh, when you first start taking that. Um, and the other thing that you can take is, is uh, dexamethasone. You can take that two milligrams every, uh, I'm sorry, that's not two hours. I think that was every eight hours or four milligrams every 12 hours. And then when you get to the point where they already have either AMS or HACE, you can go ahead and treat with the following regimen. 250 milligrams of acetazolamide per day for AMS. Dexamethasone is eight milligrams, the first dose, and then four milligrams Q6. And um, for people, acetazolamide is a sulfa medication. So if they say that they have sulfa allergies, you can go ahead and give them dexamethasone instead. And in terms of uh, high altitude cerebral edema, 
you can give them acetazolamide. I mean, it may help them a little bit. It's certainly not going to hurt them. Did you have a question? Well, just with, make sure you don't give ibuprofen at the same time. As the acetazolamide? Or the dexamethasone. Sometimes it will cause some ulcers and irritation in their stomach. We've already been taking a lot of ibuprofen. When you get the dex, uh, it can cause some ulcers if you're not careful. So really take the high dose. Okay. So thank you for, the, uh, for our video audience. Uh, he was saying, you know, make sure that you're a little careful about taking ibuprofen when you're taking the dexamethasone because of the possibility of increased gastric ulcers. The other uh, thing that we think about when we talk about altitude sickness is high altitude pulmonary edema. And uh, just like you can develop edema in, in your brain, you can also develop in your lungs. And again, uh, basically there's uh, what happens, oh, sorry about that back on. All right. Uh, so this will happen, haste occurs in, uh, or this will happen when you're at altitude as well. Uh, the incidence of this in Colorado is 1 in 10,000. By the time you get up to Denali, it's about 1 in 50. There is a strong genetic component. There's sort of people who are susceptible to high altitude pulmonary edema. And what they think is going on with this, the reason that some people develop it and other people won't, is that there is, uh, when you're going up to altitude, the people who will develop high altitude pulmonary edema will develop an uneven pulmonary vasoconstriction. So as you're going up that high, your vascular system starts to clamp down. But what they're seeing is that these, these people, the vascular system in the lung will clamp down in some areas, but not so much in other areas. And it's in those other areas where it's not clamping down very much. You're, giving, you're getting increased pressure and higher flow of fluids, and that'll cause some leaking of the fluid to occur, which develops into the uh, edema. And so what you're seeing on this chest x-ray, you can see in the lower lung fields, especially this kind of white patchy uh, um, edema that is that you can see, especially in the left lung field there. Um, and it's sort of like patches where it's there, patches where it's not. This thing's not what wanted. Um, so AMS is by far the most common. And HACE is very rare. I would, I would say that HAPE is a little bit more common than haste. But both of them, these aren't things that you're going to see very regularly. Um, AMS you'll certainly see quite a bit of, but, but HAPE is more likely to occur than, hape, than haste, excuse me. And especially in people who are predisposed. There are people who know that, they're gonna, that they've had uh, HAPE in the past. And for those people, they actually recommend prophylactic treatment for Hape when they're going to altitude. No, no one else would, you wouldn't really say, oh, well, we need to treat you prophylactically for this, other than treating you prophylactically for mountain sickness and, uh, you know, with acetazolamide. So again, the, the, the best treatment is just getting the patient out of that situation, so descent. Uh, high flow oxygen and uh, in, in this case, the drug of choice is actually nifedipine, which is a cardi uh, cardiac channel blocker. I'm sorry, calcium channel blocker. Uh, and the dose there is uh, 30 milligrams of the sustained release every 12 hours. And that's both a prophylactic dose and a treatment dose. So our second case of the evening is going to be uh, you're responding to uh, a group of hikers who called from a ridgeline. They've reported that one of their group has been struck by lightning. Patient's an otherwise healthy 20-year-old female. Uh, she is currently unresponsive, and CPR has been in progress for 10 minutes by the time you arrive. So what would you guys do in this case? Very good. So obviously, scene safety is we drill that into you guys. You know, you got to make sure that, that you're not going to become another victim here. Uh, so the storm has passed. You guys are okay where you are. Uh, so at that point, what do you want to do for this patient? Continue CPR, arrange for air transport. Okay, continue CPR. So, so the trick here on this one is uh, lightning strikes a little bit different than 
other situations in which we, we do CPR because we're basically talking about a healthy person here. She's 20 years old, doesn't have heart problems. She's basically just, her heart has been stunned because of the lightning strike. So, uh, you know, this is, you, you want to at least be giving her 30 minutes of CPR, 20, 30 minutes of CPR. Hot, good, high quality CPR. You can use an AED if available, if you guys are carrying that up with you. Uh, but the, the, the trick for this case is just to make sure that, uh, that you're continuing to do CPR on her because uh, she does have a healthy heart. If we can get that heart restarted, she'll probably do very well. Um, you also want to, of course, do your, your ABCs or CAB as they're uh, said now. You want to evaluate for any sort of fractures or traumas. Uh, tympanic membrane rupture is very common uh, after a lightning strike, and then you want to be looking for any burns or anything. Uh, especially if people are wearing any sort of jewelry and stuff, there can be burning that is associated with that. So what patients can experience after being a victim of a lightning strike is uh, they can go anywhere from just sort of atypical sensation uh, and disorientation to combativeness, uh, coma, and cardiac arrest. And there can be neurological sequelae that last for a long period of time after a lightning strike. Even if the per person seems relatively normal at the time, it, they, they can kind of uh, uh, suffer from uh, consequences of this for a long time. Uh, so the type of injuries that you have, obviously you have the direct uh, lightning strike, but you can also see uh, concussive injuries. Uh, for example, the tympanic membrane rupture, um, they can, the person can be thrown, they can have uh, direct trauma from hitting a tree, a rock, or anything else that's around them, uh, burns. Uh, glaucoma can be very common, and they, say, and they were saying that it actually occurs within a few days of the lightning strike. So they can have this sudden onset of glaucoma uh, as a result of the lightning strike. Uh, the picture that I'm showing you here is uh, what's this called a Lichtenberg figure. And uh, it's a sort of a very unique, lightning-looking um, skin. I, I guess you could call it a rash, but it's not. I mean, it's not really a rash. It's just sort of a as the as the electricity passed through her body, it just left this mark on her. And uh, you can see that on people. You can see that on on other objects uh, like. Uh, pieces of metal, pieces of glass, stuff like that. But that can be a, a sign for you uh, that the person was struck by lightning. Because sometimes it's really not that obvious. You know, some, we're going to talk about how people get struck by lightning and, and um, just a second after this slide. But sometimes you know, it's not the most obvious thing in the world that they were struck. So would you ever see that pattern on a non-lightning injury? No. And does it eventually go away? Yes. I, on a human, not on a piece of metal. How about their glaucoma? Is that reversible? If, if somebody gets glaucoma, I think that they're going to need to have treatment, just like you would for age-related glaucoma. I don't that I don't believe that that will resolve it on its own. Acetazolamide. Um. I don't think that I, I, I mean, I think I would refer them to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. I don't know that I would prophylactically start them on, on something. I apologize, I don't know the statistics of how, how common glaucoma is uh, in, in these patients, but it usually takes a couple days. I mean, it's not something that when you're on the scene would have already developed. Uh, so there is a, when, when we talk about high voltage or electricity, you know, you kind of think, oh yeah, I, I know how electricity works. It's alternating current, or if it's in my car, it's direct current. Um, with lightning, it is a little bit different than, than uh, if you're looking at a high voltage injury. Like uh, when I was in residency, we had a guy who was stripping the copper wire out of a factory in, or a warehouse that had been uh, closed in Toledo. and. Uh, Unbeknownst to him, the high voltage power was still running, and so he, he grabbed onto the, to the power lines to try to pull all that very valuable copper out and found that he was 
uh, it was still lit. He was, uh, it was still hot. He grabbed onto it. Because it was alternating current, he couldn't let go. Uh, he ended up in our burn unit for a long period of time, ended up losing both of his forearms. He was a young, uh, you know, probably late 20s, early 30s. And uh, ironically, right before I, I ended my residency career, I actually saw the guy again. He came in for a completely unrelated episode. Nicest guy in the world. Uh, and I said, oh, yeah, I treated you in the, in the burn unit when you first came in. But, you know, kind of obviously a very, very sad outcome because this guy now, no, he both didn't get the copper and, and probably got, you know, uh, arrested for that. But then also, uh, you know, lost both of his arms in, in, in the process. But when we talk about lightning, you know, we're not talking about that AC current where you're going to, you know, continue to experience it for a long period of time. So we're talking about a very brief exposure to high, high voltage uh, electricity. And so we're just comparing and contrasting here between lightning and high voltage injuries. Uh, the, the strike with the lightning tends to be more superficial, kind of a flash over uh, your skin where high voltage electri uh, electrocution tends to be more of a deep uh, type of injury. You know, we worry about rhabdomyolysis, we worry about uh, organ injury uh, when that electricity is flowing through your body. With, with lightning, that's a lot less common. Uh, we don't often need to do a fasciotomy with lightning strikes where commonly we'll have to do that because, again, because of that swelling of, of those deep tissues uh, from, the, from the deep burns that have occurred with high voltage electric, uh, electrocution. And then, you know, again, um, you do, there is that kind of explosive component, people being thrown several feet in the air, and you do have to be con, you know, thinking about what other injuries could the person have, have uh, developed because of this lightning strike. Um, so yeah, you can, well, again, it's more superficial, but yeah, you can definitely look, I mean, I would definitely expose the body, look for, uh, injuries, but again, it tends to be more superficial. So I think that you know that picture that we all have from our training manuals about the entry and exit wound, and then nothing in between. You know that that tends to be kind of the picture of high voltage energy, because again, it's that it's that deep uh, that deep burn, whereas whereas the lightning strike tends to be more superficial. I'm sorry that this is not showing up very well. Uh, this is a picture of um, basically a, a clouds and how lightning forms. Um, and what happens is as, as uh, water is, is evaporating into the air, it forms clouds, the water will start to kind of move up and down within the cloud. And in doing so, it'll start to develop uh, polarity to the cloud. And so you'll have areas of positive charges and areas of negative charges and you know some more positive charge here. And then when you have uh, lightning will typically go from like a negative to a positive. Uh, so what you'll see is you'll, you know, as you have this big buildup of negative charges in the cloud and then this relatively positively charged ground, the, the electricity will uh, flow from the cloud down to the ground and in an attempt to equalize that charge. But you can also see it, what you, what's kind of hard to see here, you can see that it'll go from the cloud to another cloud It'll go from the cloud up into the air. Uh, you can also have lightning that'll go, it'll, they're, they're called streamers, and they'll actually start to, the positive charge will start to go up from the ground, and then will meet up with a negative charge coming down. And when those two meet in the middle, then you get the lightning strike. And so there's a lot of different ways that lightning can, um, can form or develop. Um, and, that's, and it's all about the charge in the clouds and the charge on the ground. So when we talk about how people are injured by lightning, you know, I think what we all think about is this direct strike. You know, someone standing there in the bolt, you know, basically the bolt of God or Thor's hammer or what you want, to, whatever you want to believe in, just strikes strikes them down, and and you know, we all think, oh, that that person probably wasn't as good as we all thought they were, or something like that. And, uh, but that's, as you can see, that's a relatively small part of the wedge here. And so what. Uh, so, so ground, the ground strike or the direct strike is, uh, I'm sorry, the ground current is the most common type. And that's 
when you see lightning uh, striking the ground and then traveling through the ground. And the reason that we uh, experience the lightning strike is because two different parts of your body are touching two different areas of voltage. So as the lightning is coming across through the ground, you may, you, uh, one part of your body might be touching a relatively uncharged part of the ground and then, you, and then the other part of the body gets struck by the area that is being charged by the lightning and that will cause a current to flow through your body which you experience as the lightning strike. Side splash or side flash is the, is the next most common and that's uh, lightning hitting uh, an object that then splashes onto uh, another object which would be you. Uh, so when you think of like why they tell you not to stand by a metal pole or a tree, uh, and that's because we're kind of worried about that side splash uh, electrocution where the lightning would hit the tree and then bounce off the tree onto you. Uh, contact would be pretty similar to side splash or side flash, but in this case you're actually touching the object. So if you're touching the, you know, it's, uh, think of um, Ben Franklin holding his kite with his, you know, with the key on it and the, and the kite getting struck by lightning and then the lightning following the, the line down, that would be a contact. Uh, or if you're holding on to a, a flagpole or something like that. That upward leaders, that was the one that I was telling you about where the positive charge will start to raise up from the ground and then the negative charge hits it and where the two meet, that's where the lightning strike occurs, then it goes all the way down to the ground. And then uh, direct strike, again, is, is what we actually think about where the lightning just, you know, hand of God comes down and knocks you down. So third case, um, you got, you're on a medical support team, you decided to take your vacation in southern Utah and th thought, well, I'm gonna be a part of a support team for an ultra long distance marathon. So these guys are running, um, this is actually a race called Racing the Planet, which is in China, and I'm gonna be helping them out in, a, uh, in May. And these guys will run a marathon every day for four days and then the fifth day they run two marathons and then the sixth day they have a relatively light day of only like 15 to 20 miles. So uh, I am not a long distance runner but you know but it's kind of fun to be able to get out there and, and help these guys out so um, so you're supporting such a uh, type of endeavor in southern Utah and a uh, one of the runners is carried into your aid station. She's a 34-year-old female. Her skin is hot and dry, and she is stuporous and tired. Her temperature right now is 40.1 degrees Celsius or 104.2 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what do you guys think might be going on, and what, are you, what would you like to do with her in the middle of the southern Utah desert? Yeah, so heat stroke, and she needs to be cooled down. That's pretty much... Where we're at. And isn't the differential diagnosis that she's dry? Like if we see an exhaustion, she'd be sweaty, heat stroke. Right. So a lot of times we think of by the time someone has gotten to heat stroke, they, they've sort of lost the ability to to sweat and to create that uh, to create that evaporative heat loss through sweat. So that's why uh, that's why we want to cool them down and a lot of times what we can do is something like getting them wet or spraying them down with, with water and then using fans to help that water evaporate off their skin. So heat illness, again, just like we were talking about with uh, AMS and, and high altitude cerebral edema, it tends to be a spectrum. And that spectrum can start everywhere from heat cramps and go all the way to heat stroke. So heat cramps, uh, these are musculoskeletal cramping due to spasming of the muscles. They tend to be pretty agonizing. Um, but not really life-threatening. They usually happen in people who are not really acclimatized to a lot of exercise, who decide to you know, maybe go hike in the heat or go, uh, you know, go for a run or something like that. And um, typically, athletes will be more immune to this, uh, but if they become sufficiently salt-depleted, salt they can also experience these type of uh, heat cramps. Um, and the treatment for this is just rest and repl replenishment of salt. As we move on, we get to heat exhaustion, which is associated with uh, core temperatures. Uh, so we're in the Celsius system. Do you guys use Celsius or Fahrenheit? I can, I can talk it either way. Okay, so 
101.3 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and the inability to maintain their cardiac output. And so these guys will be, will be looking fatigued, dizzy, nausea, vomiting, malaise, hypotension, and tachycardia. Uh, again, you know, you want to get them out of the heat, get them into a cool, shaded area, have them lie down, um, elevate the legs, and try to uh, loosen any clothing that they may have, and then uh, ultimately what we want to do is uh, actively cool their skin and rehydrate. And again, this is, uh, so heat exhaustion, I mean, they're, they're pretty much done for the day, but it's, it's not the big emergency that heat stroke is. They're not yet having all that end organ damage that we worry about with heat stroke. So, you know, this is the kind of thing where if you can get them feeling better, you know, they'll probably end up doing pretty well. But they have to obviously be a little bit more cognizant of what they're doing in the future, making sure that they're staying cool, that they're staying well hydrated and all that. Uh, the other thing that you can think about in these kind of situations is hyponatremia. Uh, hyponatremia, which is uh, low salt, tends to be, especially in these endurance athletes, that it's the most common electrolyte abnormality. Uh, it's seen in uh, sodium levels less than 135 milliequivalents per liter, which probably doesn't mean so much to you guys because uh, how are you going to measure it? Um, sometimes in these ultra long distance marathons, they will actually uh, bring those ISTAT machines with where they can actually draw a blood sample and, and run some basic labs. But uh, ultimately, what, what you're looking for can look a lot like heat exhaustion. Uh, it tends to be more common with exertional, uh, in, exertional exercise lasting for a great deal of time, like eight hours or more. Um, this is one of these things where the best thing that for you guys to determine whether this is happening or not is sort of um, historical uh, information. If, if the patient's telling you that they've been drinking a lot of water and sweating a ton, but they haven't really been using any Gatorade or, or any sort of salt replacement, then you, you, this may be a little bit higher on your radar. But if they're like, oh yeah, no, I, t I drink water, but then I'm also taking a ton of uh, Gatorade and I've been eating some salty snacks and you know I'm doing all good then you're going okay well maybe this isn't so much hyponatremia but that this is the other one to think about obviously with hyponatremia you don't want to load them up on a, a lot more water because you're just going to make the situation worse uh, again when we looked at um, heat exhaustion you know you look at some of this stuff malaise disorientation nausea and fatigue those sound pretty similar to what we were talking about before. They tend to be a little bit hyper-reflexic that, you know, if you're really good at doing that part of your physical exam, you may go, huh, that, that guy seems really hyper-reflexic and that might, um, you know, lead you to, believe, to steer more towards this direction. But, you know, this is something that can be dangerous because as, as their sodium continues to drop, they can start to seize, they can get into a coma and you can die of hyponatremia. Treatment in the field would be, uh, you know, water restriction as soon as they can, trying to get them to eat or drink salty uh, stuff. And then if, if needed, you can give them D5 uh, normal saline through an IV. Okay, exertional heat stroke. So a lot of times what we talk about when we talk about heat stroke is sort of like classic heat stroke. It's the, you know, old lady who lives in the, on, in the, uh, unair conditioned apartment in the middle of summer and is taking uh, diuretics and uh, is not, you know, doesn't do very well. This is, what we're talking about here is more the guys that are doing ultra long distance marathons and are, have been running for a long, long period of time. They tend to be healthy and younger people. We start to see, it can be actually a, a wide range of temperatures, but it can be from 41 to 47 degrees Celsius and develop uh, a wide variety of responses, including uh, systemic uh, inf in inflammatory response syndrome uh, or disseminated, disseminated intervascular coagulation. That's where your, um, thrombo your platelets start to clump up. You start to see petechia all over the body. Uh, these are kind of really bad things to, to be developing and leading to multi-organ system failure, which is sort of funneling the drain before death. 
Treatment, uh, most important thing we can do for these patients is get them cool. And so again, you want to lie them down. Uh, if, if they're in a coma, you want to put them on their side to try to help protect their airway. Get, get rid of their clothes as much as possible. If you can do cold water or immersion, that's good, but a lot of times that's not very practical because you know you have someone who's stuporous or in a coma, you, if you're going to throw them in a lake or in a bathtub, it's really hard to protect their airway and stuff. But ultimately you want to try to get them as cool as, as quickly as possible. If you have ice, you can pack them in ice. Uh, but probably what you're, you know, from an EMS and, and search and rescue standpoint, what we're actually going to be able to do is sponge them or spray them with water and then just try to fan them to, to get that evaporative cooling uh, to help bring their temperature down. The goal is to decrease, decrease the temperature below 39 degrees Celsius. People can be, uh, this is, you know, kind of ironically associated with hypothermia a lot. I think as providers, we can be very aggressive in trying to cool them down. Um, but they, in the state that, that uh, they're in, they can't put up a good um, response to, to cooling off. They can't try to warm themselves back up. And so we can actually be overly aggressive, cool them to the point where they actually become hypothermic. So uh, while, we want, while the goal is to bring their temperature down, the goal is not to bring their temperature down so much that we're now going from a hyperthermic patient to a hypothermic patient. Uh, also, you can fluid resuscitate the person. It was kind of interesting when I was reading about this, there was, their recommendations were fluid resuscitation, but then they pretty much proceeded to tell, tell me that every type of fluid pretty much sucks. Um, they were said, sort of, it sounded like the best thing to use would be um, uh, albumin, but I don't think you guys carry albumin so much, so I don't think it's going to be very useful. The reason that it sucks is because, as you guys know, uh, normal saline and lactated ringers, which would be really good, uh, do a lot of third spacing. And third spacing is fine when you're an otherwise healthy person, but uh, it, part of the, the process of, um, of heat stroke is that their capillaries become much more permeable than they used to be. So they're going to be even more, they're going to be spacing even more fluid, and by doing that you're going to separate the tissues from the blood that it needs. And so they were kind of saying to be careful with uh, normal saline and lactated ringer. So I guess what I would say is you still want to do it. You still want to, you know, you want to replenish their blood volume. You want to give, uh, you know, and try to improve their cardiovascular function. But I, I wouldn't go overboard on it, I guess, is what I can tell you. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a really good recommendation for you there. And then the other thing is just, uh, Tylenol is not going to help in these, in these patients and can actually do worse damage to their liver that's already suffering uh, with an insult to begin with. So um, they're, not, they're not feverish because of uh, internal process that we, can, you know, that we can improve with Tylenol. They're feverish because they're just too stinking hot because they've been out in the sun and exercising. Case four is kind of quick. I know that we're running out of time here, but um, this is... Uh, you were called to a local lake, uh, friends of, uh, it was a party that was going on. Uh, they found the guy out floating in the lake. They went in and they, re they grabbed him. He, uh, he appears to be intoxicated right now. When the, they got, first got him out of the water, he was pulseless. Bystander CPR was performed and he did regain pulses. Uh, right now you're assessing him. He's able to move all extremities, but does have increased worth of work of breathing. Ronchi is noted in the lower lung bases. His vital signs are as follows, respiratory rate of 24, heart rate of 110, blood pressure of 88 over 40, and O2 sat of 82% on room air. So what do you guys want to do for this patient? What do you need to get the temperature? Recovery position. 38.6, <laughs> just for you. We don't have to worry about that. So recovery position, okay. Oxygen, mm-hmm. Would you do a C collar, backboard, the whole nine yards on this guy? Yeah, so I actually, another case that I uh, saw when I was uh, in residency is we had a, a young, I think he was older than 17, but a young medical student who was out at a party uh, drinking, was uh, found in a pond, 
They pulled him out. He was able to move everything at the scene, went to an outlying emergency department. Emergency department sent him to our level one trauma center. And it wasn't until the neuro resident assessed him at the level one trauma center that they noticed that he wasn't moving his arms and his legs. And the guy ended up having, I believe it was a C5 fracture. And you know, they put him in tongs. They, they tried to correct that insult, but you know, it was, I know we're, we're sort of at a point where we're talking to where that conversation about backboard and seat collar and all that is back in question, you know, are, the, are we really helping people? How much are we helping people by using that? I know I have a lot of my colleagues who are not big fans of backboards and seat collars, but I would say this is a, definitely a situation because he's intoxicated, because you can't clear his neck, because uh, you can't trust him, that I think that I would be, um, I would be doing the whole CTLS precautions in this guy. Uh, but yes, obviously his vital signs suck. We need to move him. Um, these guys can also start to do worse, so they can actually look okay af immediately after coming out of the water. Obviously he was, had some CPR, so that's not okay to begin with, but they can look relatively okay, but uh, the insult to the lungs can be such that they actually start to get worse over the next few days. So. Um, this used to be really confusing with terminology, and I don't know what you guys use in your system here, but um, you know there used to be so many terms being thrown around about what kind of drowning it was, whether it was a near drowning, like does that mean that you were standing on the dock, but, but if you had been in the water, you would drown, or, or you know, was it a wet drowning or a wet, uh, dry drowning? I don't even know if you can figure that out unless you're a coroner. Um, you know, there's all sorts of terms that were thrown around, so. Uh, I think it, we're trying to really simplify this and just say, look, either everyone drowned, okay? So either you drowned and you're dead, you drowned and you have some sort of mo morbidity, or you drowned and you don't have morbidity. And that makes it very simple. Everybody knows what you're talking about. So either you're dead, you got something wrong with you, or you're okay. And uh, I don't know what you guys are going with, but I think this makes it a lot easier when we're talking about communication and trying not to miss things when we're doing our handoffs and stuff. Uh, that makes it a lot clearer for people. Crap, I spent a lot of time building this and it doesn't really come across very clear. So uh, there, this was a great graph that was pretty much everything you needed to know. And since you can't read it, I guess you're just gonna not know anything. But no, we'll go through it. Uh, it's basically six grades of drowning um, from zero to six, I'm sorry, seven grades, uh, with associated mortality in percentage. So your zero and your ones are pretty much people that you're gonna be evaluating and ultimately saying, you know what, you can go. The, the two through uh, five, I'm sorry, the two, the two and threes are people who are gonna need to be admitted into the four and fives and sixes are gonna be going to you know, your ICU or your morgue. Uh, so it, with your zero and one class, your, mort your uh, mortality rate is essentially zero. Not, you know, it's really, uh, these guys are doing okay. They may have a little bit of a cough in, as a level one or no cough at all. They have good strong radial pulses. Uh, if, it's, if they're a zero, you just say, hey, guess what? You look okay. Don't be such an idiot in the future. Don't drown, and you'll be all right. We don't need to transport you. For your ones, you know, they're coughing. They, they may have a bit of a cough. You know, rest, rewarm, make sure that they're doing okay. Tell them, again, not to be an idiot, and then let them go on their own way. Um, when we get up to a level two, we're seeing a very slight uh, mortality rate of 0.6%. Uh, you may hear some small rails and, and a little bit of, they may have a little bit of kind of foaminess in their mouth. Uh, they still have strong pulses for both twos and threes. May need to give them a little oxygen via the nasal cannula. You know, if you're in the back in the middle of nowhere, you may just say, hey, you know what, we're just going to hang out with you. We're going to watch you for six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, see how you do. And if you do okay, we're going to peace out and you can go on your vacation. Don't do it again. Or you may just say, you know what, we're going to bring you to the hospital, play this conservatively. They may just want to watch you overnight. We'll, we'll check your vital signs as we go en route, and you may stay in the hospital overnight or stay in the emergency department. As we go up to our three, now we have about a 5% chance of mortality. Uh, you're starting to see some pulmonary edema developing. Again, their pulses are fine. Uh, these guys put them on an O2 uh, via a non-rebreather mask. 
Uh, you do need to transport them, you need to check their vital signs, and they should stay overnight in the hospital. Uh, by the time we get up to four, we're at now at about a 20% mortality rate. Uh, again, they have acute pulmonary edema. Now you're starting to see hypotension. So this is the first one where we're actually starting to see a drop in their blood pressure. Again, you're going to want to uh, do the oxygen, may want to uh, do some ACLS as needed. Um, and you, you want to get this person out of here. You guys, I'm, I'm guessing when it comes to things like doing ACLS, <coughs> it's just like, let's get to the hospital and let those guys deal with it. Uh, and then, you know, depending on where they're at, you may need to in intubate them, you may need to do some pressure management, and these guys are going to end up being in the uh, intensive care unit. And again, so five is this person's in respiratory arrest, hypotensive, get them the heck out of Dodge. Um, you want to get them to the hospital as quickly as you can. You want to do all your ACLs, things including intub intubation, et cetera. They're going to be in the ICU. And by the time we get to six, we're up at now a 93% uh, mortality rate. So, I mean, look at how quickly that, that went. Like, we were really at almost nothing, and then it just kind of, boom, shot up by the time we get to six. And these people are in cardiopulmonary arrest, and, you know, you can, at the scene, you can do your CPR, you can try to do what, you know, what you're going to do, but, but very, very unlikely that this person's going to be saved. And, you know, so this person transport to the morgue in the end. So that is the uh, whole lecture. Uh, if you guys have any questions, be more than willing to attempt to answer them. Otherwise, uh, AirMed is here, and I'm sure that they're going to want to do some more fun things with you guys. Any questions at all? All right, thanks again for having me, guys. <laughs>